Hello? Good. You all can hear me. Put this down somewhere. <laughs> well, I'll just set it on the ground. If you have your scriptures, turn to Psalm 18. So Psalm 18 is, is a wonderful psalm. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about just the general nature of the psalm, how it's constructed, um, kind of the, and then the title, and, um, and then the actual text is going to be Psalm 18, 1 through 3. Okay, and the title of the sermon is God is a Christian sure defense. So a little bit about, about the Psalm 18 from what we know. Um, the title kind of gives it kind of pretty much a way, per se, to the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord rescued him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So a lot of the commentators that I read on this um, seem to indicate that this is a... Um, David wrote this later on in life after looking back on all the Lord has done for him. Um, you know, it, it, some, some had said that it was immediately after these events, but the way it's, it's constructed in the sentence um, doesn't seem to indicate that. I would, I would venture to guess that David reflecting on what the Lord has done in his life, looked back and saw the, how the Lord had directed his life and, and delivered him from all of his enemies. You know, one thing that the uh, Christian and the non-Christian have in common is trouble, hardship, and a variety of other adjectives that we can all describe. But how we react to those as Christians and who in, in whom we depend upon as Christians should be vastly different from the unsaved. But at the time, it's not that easy, is it? When you're going through some things that you really just are wondering, what are you doing, Lord? Why is this happening? It's so hard at the time to realize the hand of God. It, it's much easier when we're, when we're a ways back from it. You know, look at, look at um, Jacob, for example. You know, Jacob... I mean, not Jacob, Joseph. Joseph, for example. You know, Joseph had been given these great dreams and, and more or less promises uh, by God. And yet here he is in prison, in the Egyptian prison for something he didn't even do for more than two years. He had to be thinking, what are you doing? Where are these, where are these promises at? It, later on, he realized it. Um, another example is Job. I mean, you know, Job was, was a devout man of God. He, he followed the Lord as best he could, and the Lord blessed his life. And the Lord saw fit to, to allow Satan to test him and to remove basically everything from his life. You know, it, Job is very open and honest in, in his book that he questions God. Then God shows up, and he understands. <laughs> so my point is, it's common for us to question and to even question God and to wonder, I don't understand this. There's been life, there have been several things that happened in Trishanai's life that uh, um, we can tell you about that we just have no idea what, why, why this is happening. Um, later on, sometimes there, we, we find out, sometimes we don't, and we have to be okay with that. But one thing is common. But the Christian is God is our sure defense. It absolutely has to be unwavering truth that we would just totally rely on. If not, then you need to talk to Pastor or Terry. You may have a salvation issue, but that's another sermon. So the construction of, of Psalm 18 is, is an individual psalm of thanksgiving. And it has some royal characteristics to this. Um, the, uh, there's, other, there's other songs in, in the scriptures that, that kind of parallel the, the same construction. 
Um, the, uh, uh, in Exodus 15, Song of Moses has a similar construction. It's a, a song of thanksgiving. Uh, the other one is a song of Deborah and Barak and Judges. Um, very similar in construction. It'd be, it starts with praise and ends with praise, and there's life in the middle, per se. So the, uh, um, you know, the psalm is, is constructed in such a way that it, it kind of characterizes David's life and his dependence and reliance on God through absolutely everything. Um, so it kind of breaks down into three categories, per se, or three stages of his life. Um, the first stage is, 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 in the commentary that I read, was pit of peril. In other words, normal, everyday life, circumstances beyond our control. That's the trouble, persecutions, and so on and so forth. Um, but in some, in that, it, but that basically covers verses 4 through 19. Um, and I skipped one through three because that's going to be our sermon. But uh, um, in verses four through five, is, is David, he's, David is expressing his desperation, his need for God in the in midst of the trouble and the persecution and the trial of, of everything. Um, and in verses six through 15, talks about, you know, his God is his defender his reliance and his need for God, his faith in God if, for that deliverance. And then ultimately, in the verses 16 to 19, is God's deliverance. God's, God shows up, God's action. So that is in the pit of peril. And then the, then the, the other commentary said that it was the 18, 20 through 28 is ethical integrity, which is just kind of a big fancy word for relying on God per se. Um, in verses 20 to 26 talks about um, the principles of the Lord's direction. In other words, holiness is sought, seeking the Lord's direction and will and guidance amidst the trouble and hardship of life. Um, 27 to 28, the, pri the privileges of the Lord's direction. I think that really kind of refers to our redemption. And then, um, and then the last section is the turbulent atmosphere of leadership. Okay, anybody who's been in a position of power and leadership or authority of any kind knows that it is very turbulent waters. There is pressure from all sides, from 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 all kinds of of, of pressures from the outside, as as you guys very well know. Um, but here in, in, in David's life, David was a military-minded man, okay? So his, his construction of, of, these, of, of what we've been talking about are, 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 are more or less in that area, in that realm. Um, but the first section in 29 through 42 is military leadership. In other words, he's seeking God's protection for his, for his God-given assignment, his God-given roles. And then the second portion, or the last portion of, the, of 40, 43 through 45 is um, the theocratic leadership. In other words, he's relying on God to provide the, the guidance and the direction that he needs um, to, do his, to do his assigned task, to do his assigned duties that the Lord gave him to do. And then Psalm 40, 18, 46 through 50, it closes again with thanksgiving. So Psalm 18, one through three, we'll go ahead and read that. And then we'll uh, talk about, then we'll give the, to the sermon. Beginning in verse one, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. So like I said, the title of the sermon is um, God's, God is the Christian's sure defense. 
these terms are all military kind of terms, either defensive or offensive terms. Anybody who served in the military has any sort of military background can recognize these fairly well. But to kind of punctuate how David is describing the Lord. And, and, and by the way, the, the Lord here is, is Adonai. It's the I am in Exodus. And that ties back to Jesus when he was in, in, in the book of John, where he said the seven I am statements. So therefore, we know that, that Jesus is the, the I am from that as well. But to kind of punctuate what I'm saying is here, David is saying, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my deliverer. The Lord is my God. The Lord is my rock in whom I take refuge. The Lord is my shield and the horn, and the Lord is my, the horn of my salvation. My, the Lord is my stronghold, and thus the Lord is worthy to be praised. And as a result, I will be saved from my enemies. So trouble comes from all different sides, from Christians and non-Christians, like I, as I said. But Jesus gave us a promise in John 16, one, verses 1 through 4, that a lot of Jesus' promises were very comforting. Um, this one is more of a reality check. Jesus said, I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you in the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Second, Timothy also gives us another promise that is really not all that comforting. 2 Timothy 3.12, all who seek to, to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, period. So we should not be surprised when trouble and persecution and hardships come. You know, and, and in fact, we, we, we should be able to grow by those. Um, definitely not at the time sometimes. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes we can see, see the hand moving of the Lord. Sometimes that hand is the Lord's discipline because of fill in the blank. Sometimes it's just correction and training in righteousness, as, as scripture says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Sometimes that is what we absolutely need. You know, if first Peter um, talks, first Peter 1 talks about this, and James talks about this. You know, James says, Count it all joy when you endure trials of many kinds or various kinds. Um, I don't really consider trials joyful. I, maybe it's just me, but I don't, I don't like those much. You know, the, the bad news from the doctor, you have cancer, you, you have a heart condition, you, you fill in the blank. Um, the, the list is, is pretty much endless. Um, not to not to berate a point, but the point is we all have things in our life that happen. So what do we do with those? When they come, we should not be, number one, we should not be surprised because everybody goes through these. And a lot of it's the result of the fall of man. Adam and Eve sinned, disobeyed God, mistrusted God, and as a result, here we are. So we shouldn't be surprised when these things happen, but when they happen, we need to remember how to handle these. You know, different people in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you know, they, they give us a good example. Um, Hebrews outlines these, and Hebrews 11 outlines these, some of these um, in, the, in Hebrews 11, about the, the, the chapter on, on faith. Um, how, how they handled the situations of, of, the, of their times 
during that time. A classic example of this is, um, I almost can't say their names without going to Veggie Tales, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> um, those of you who have kids who have seen that know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but anyway, you know, they, here they were faced with a decision. Either A, I sp saved my life and I pretend to worship this idol. Or I stand up for God and say, no, I'm not doing that. They obviously chose, no, I'm not doing that. And they took the consequences, whatever those consequences were going to be. They knew the consequences. They knew the result, but they were going to be thrown into the furnace. But I love their faith. They said, even if the Lord doesn't rescue us, know this, that our, the God we serve is able to rescue us if he so chooses, basically, basically is, what they, what, is what they said. And other people in the Bible have, have expressed similar situations. Um, Daniel, for example, he, he had the, uh, he was in the lion's den. He was thrown in the lion's den. Why? Because he prayed. Because he was offering his, his daily service to the Lord in prayer. And the people who did not like him sought to do away with him. And we all, again, know the result of that story as well. Um, you know, and the other people, so the apostles in the New Testament, they, they did not shrink from, from the, the trouble and the persecution and the hardship. Um, you know, Paul, for example, you know, it's when Paul was, was, was saved on the road to Damascus, God told Philip to go and anoint Paul's eyes, Saul's eyes. And then Philip said, well, Lord, do you know who this is? He's killing your people, putting them in prison. And then God says, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my sake. I find that astounding that knowing that the obedience was still there. So there are plenty of examples of, of, the, of the right way to handle this. There's also a lot of ways in the, in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Judges, about people who did it wrongly. You know, pride gets in the way. Samson, Samson and Delilah, classic example. It wasn't until after he was humbled, again, then he came, he came back to where he should have been all along. But pride gets in the way. And a lot of times, pride gets in our way, if we want to be completely honest about it. So that's kind of the first point is, to whom do we go? You know, or A, we have really, we, really, we have two choices. We either, A, we follow along with the world and go the worldly way, the worldly wisdom, follow on, depend upon man and man's salvation and or man's, man's deliverance from X, whatever X is. Or we rely on God and for his direction. As Christians, obviously, we should choose the latter instead of the former. But it's easier said than done when you're faced with a split second decision. What do you do? How do you make that decision? I can't stand my fingers anymore. <laughs> how, do you, how do you do that like that? On a, on a dime. I think number one, you have to be studied up in the word of God. Number two, you have a constant prayer life, a consistent prayer life. And not just for your own needs, but the needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. You know, we have it pretty easy in this country. It's getting harder, yes. And I won't disagree with that. But we have it pretty easy in this country. There are Christians around the world just for praying can be killed in countries we shouldn't mention. But here they are being faithful to the Lord and willing to 
to endure whatever may come. So, you know, when, when we're faced with this, you know, God is our sure defense. You know, so what does, what does David say? What are the terms that David uses? He says that the Lord is his strength. He is all that he physically needs to survive. That's, this, that's, he gives him the strength that he needs to for the next day's tasks, basically. The Lord is his rock. And he uses the very term, these terms. This, this just isn't a, a rock on the side of the hill. This is like one of the boulders at Elephant Rock. I mean, they're, they're, it's a massive rock. So the, they can't possibly be moved. In other words, there, if, if I place my faith and trust in God for this situation, God will be my, my protection. He will be that sure foundation that I can build on. Number two, the Lord is my fortress. Well, that's, that's pretty easy. If you've ever been, been to some of the old forts, um, you know, when we went to St. Augustine, the, uh, the fort there in St. Augustine, um, pretty impressive structure for being so old. Um, but it, it, it was a sure defense. You know, that, that fortress had never been breached. Um, it was, which is pretty amazing when, it, when you come to think about it. it. Says the Lord is my deliverer. In other words, you know, David knows that that God can take him out of the situation or or solve the situation if he so chooses. It doesn't. The construction doesn't doesn't seem to indicate that David knew the Lord was going to deliver him. He's looking back on his life, thinking about how good the Lord has been to him. And I think we can all be at that place. We can all look at our lives, no matter what's going on at the present time. We can all look back a ways in, in, in our path and see exactly how the Lord has moved in our life. And that gives us the strength and the confidence to go forward and face the next challenge, the next hardship, the next trial. And again, he talks about, David talks about the Lord being his rock, but instead this time he says, is he, the Lord is my rock in whom I take refuge. In other words, he's the shelter from the storm. And then he moves to, to more of, of, you know, theological constructs. The horn, the Lord is the horn of my salvation. The word horn generally refers to positions or, or somebody who has power. So the Lord is the power of my salvation. And he is my stronghold and my shield. And as a result, the Lord is worthy to be praised. You know, I gave you the bad news, some of the good, bad promises, not necessarily bad, but maybe unpleasant to think about promises, but there's also tons of good promises as well. You know, in, uh, again, in, in John, John 16, John 16, 33, Jesus said, I've said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Period. But, I love that word, but. But, take heart. I have overcome the world. And the other promise that I kind of alluded to earlier was even in the midst that the Bible, as I said, is our, our foundation should be our foundation, where, where we go to learn, how do I handle X? It may not be spelled out perfectly, but the principles are contained in the Bible to handle every situation of life. But the word of God is, it says in, in Hebrews that the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Also, 
that the Word of God helps train us, correct us, rebuke us, so that we can be in a necessary or right standing before God to train us in righteousness, to do the good work that God has prepared for us in advance, as it says in Ephesians 2.10. So the kind of the takeaway, what's the so what? I mean, all this is nice and good and true, obviously, but what about the next time you're faced with X? Do we just go on and say, well, this was a good sermon, but I'm going to continue to trust in the world system? Or are we going to make a change and look to God for the deliverance? And know that no matter the situ no matter the, re the physical result of our life, of, of the problem of X, that whether it's deliverance here or deliverance in heaven, God is sure to answer X and solve for X, to use a algebra term. So that's kind of the so what. We're, we can get so wrapped up in life. And, and the world is telling us, especially during this time, you need to do this. You need to do that. Well, maybe we do. Maybe we don't. We each had to make those decisions for ourselves of what we're going to do and then stick by them. And as anybody with kids, you should be teaching them, there are logical and natural consequences for actions. And that just isn't for kids. That's for us adults as well. We, there are logical and natural consequences for our sins, for our disobedience. David is a classic example. David. We all know of David's sin and David's shortfall, okay? David was a great military leader. He wasn't that great of a father from, from what I can gather. Um, there was, there was the things that, that he, didn't, he didn't do. He didn't, he didn't discipline um, one of his sons who had to, in the incestual relationship with, with, with a, um, one of his step, you know, step, uh, stepsisters. He didn't, he didn't respond. And therefore, you know, as a result of his sin with Bathsheba, it caused David's whole world to become unraveled. But still, David, David held on to the Lord. Even, even in the midst of his sin, he held on. And that's, that's the place where we have got to stand. We've got to hold on to where we are, to what we know. We've got to hold on firmly to the word of God, trust him completely. As you know, we we talk about often in, in, in our house that either the Lord, the Lord is sovereign over all or he's not sovereign at all. And that is the bedrock foundation where we have got to put our, make our stand, so to speak, and say, this is going to be it. And then we just, then we just make that defense. But making that defense, there are consequences. And we've got to be okay with those consequences. And those consequences sometimes are not pleasant. But sometimes it's exactly what we need because we've been too comfortable in life, too comfortable in what the Lord has done. We need to be challenged. We need to be chastised. We need to be trained to fully rely on the Lord. And I'm probably running. I'm going to do okay. So what's the other takeaway? How can God, whom we can't see, be our sure defense? Well, number one, obviously, he says so. We can trust him completely. And like I, like I said before, look at, the, look at how, uh, your past. Look at your past and the past deliverances the Lord has done to your, in your life. We each have a story. 
Some of us have a more dramatic story than others, but we each have a story. We each have a story of how God has delivered us from past things, or how God has stepped in and, and, and acted and delivered us. So if God has taken care of the past, he will certainly take care of the future, right? That is our answer. How do we know God is our sure defense? Well, he's done it in the past. He's doing it in the present. And naturally, logically, he would do it again in the future. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your, your defense and in defense of us and defense of our and helping us in our problems and our situations. Lord, we know that you are sovereign over all things. We know you can take and resolve any situation at your bidding. Lord, we also know that sometimes we have to go through things because it helps build our faith help strengthen our faith, helps build our reliance upon you and not upon the world system. Father, we also thank you for the times of, uh, of hardship and difficulty. Because I know in my own personal life, Lord, those are the times that I've grown the most is during those times. My prayer life is sharper. My Bible reading is more intense. My complete reliance is upon you alone because I can't solve it. And maybe that was the point all along. Lord, we just thank you for the many things you've done for this church. We ask you to bless Pastor and Irma as they are traveling. Help them to have a good time. Help them to not to worry too much about Joel. And Lord, just return them to us safely. Allow them to be refreshed of soul and spirit that they may come back refreshed, Lord, to serve you more. We thank you for your goodness, your love, and your mercy. It's in your name we pray. Amen.